When you sit down to enjoy your favorite musical artist, you may find yourself thinking about the story that they're telling. Or maybe you're dazzled by their playing and you're wishing you could do the same. Or maybe you're just happy to be carried away by the music and not think about anything. Sometime, though, you might spare a thought for the person who captured that performance. My guest has been doing this work for more than three decades. He's the founder of Champagne's legendary Pogo Studios, where he made more than a thousand recordings with a wide range of musicians. He now makes his home in Nashville, where he teaches audio engineering at the Blackbird Academy. He is also a musician. Since 1980, he's played bass with Captain Rat and the Blind Rivets. I'm very pleased to welcome to Illinois Pioneers, Mark Rubel. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you, Dave. I'm really pleased to be here. We really appreciate it. I understand that uh, the beginning of this recording business, at least for you, was when you were eight. Your parents gave you a little tape recorder? Yes. Uh, I think for Christmas I got a little battery-powered tape machine that had a, a built-in microphone. It was tethered. It had an on-off switch on it, mm -hmm. uh, three-inch tape reels. And uh, I would spend hours recording things, playing them back, flipping the reels, playing them backwards cutting them up with safety scissors, taping them back together, speeding it up, slowing it down, and laughing, uh, which is pretty much what I do every day now, <laughs> uh, except people pay me money to do it sometimes. So you, you did everything in, in terms of playing around with the sound that you possibly could mechanically by playing it backwards, forwards, st splicing it, editing the way we did in the old days. And still techniques we use now. Uh, so what sort of things did you record? Oh, mostly babbling. Uh, weirdly, I found the the tapes lately, I haven't had the nerve to transfer them. <laughs> I guess we'll find <laughs> out. The first studio, and I, we'll, we'll talk about Pogo, and I sure. think that, that a lot of people know about Pogo having been in downtown Champaign for a long time. But before that, you did have a studio, a place that was in an old house in Urbana? The corner of Clark and Busey. Uh, I ran across a fellow named Peter Penner, mm -hmm. who had had a studio in southern Illinois. When I met him, all the recording equipment was in storage. And he was uh, putting a group of sort of uh, ex-hippies together to put together a kind of recording collective. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was getting ready to take a solo bicycle trip from Dublin to Morocco, which he then did. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so we just took what we had and wired it together and put it in this little house that we were renting uh, for $100 a month and called it a studio. You know, knocked holes in the walls, put windows in the internal walls and all the things you need to do. Uh, and. Uh, all the other partners had electrical engineering degrees and jobs, and I had a wacky liberal arts science degree and uh, a number of small jobs, and uh, so I got elected to run the studio and deal with the clients and do the sessions, and I've been doing it ever since. So how, in that, that first studio, this was uh, uh, Faithful Sound? Faithful Sound, named it's after called. a Todd Rundgren song. How much did you charge for an hour of recording time? Our, begin our initial rate was $4.50 an hour. Pretty good deal. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good deal. And Considering now you probably, I don't know, what's the, what's the going rate now? It, it varies. It, un, unfortunately, the going rate for recording studio is less than it was in the 70s. Everything else has gotten more expensive. But due to the prevalence of home recording, really, studios charge less. So uh, the current POGO rate is $55 an hour. And it, see, that struck me as extraordinarily affordable, what, what you were charging at POGO. I, I would expect that if you would go to some place and you were some sort of big name performer, you'd be paying hundreds of dollars an hour at least, if not more. Well, it's an interesting dynamic from a business point of view. Uh, you know, the people have alternatives they can record at home or they can record in smaller places for less money, and they tend to make the judgment of whether they're going to record with you on a hourly basis rather than a per project basis. So um, it's something that I think my industry has not done a good job of defending, which is the viability and need for professional recording studios. And people don't necessarily realize all the things that they get from being in a professional environment. Mm -hmm. Well, when, when you started doing this seriously, and I don't know if that was in the, as far back as the faithful sound days, or you even want to take it back further, uh, what, what sort of reward do you think there was for you? What did you, what about it excited you that made you want to do that? Everything. <laughs> really everything. I, I remember when I first set foot in a, in a professional studio, we'd been doing lots of home recordings. You know, when my parents would go on vacation, I think all my contemporaries would have a big party, and we would turn the house into a recording studio, you know, and just put borrowed and rented gear in there. Um, but I remember when I first walked into a, a real recording studio called Silver Dollar Studios in Urbana, and 
when I walked in there, the angels sang and a light came down from the heavens and I just realized this is a wonderful environment and everything about it is exciting. And I still feel the same way every time I walk into a studio now. Is it that, because I think what people don't really realize, and if they think about it at all, is that the, the person who's doing that, that kind of work, this goes way beyond turning knobs uh, or even setting up a microphone that an artist will, will stand in front of. Ideally, there's a collaborative thing that goes on here that then the end product should be better because you were there than if you hadn't been involved. Absolutely. I think it's almost a disservice to our job uh, that we're called engineers because we're not really engineers in the sense of somebody who designs bridges or, you know, fixes things. Uh, maybe a little bit more in the sense of somebody who runs a train. Uh, but there, there's so many different skills involved and really the, the knob twiddling and the microphone setting are an expression of that. Um, so we, uh, it's a collaborative art, so we have to work with other artists to try and realize their vision and uh, there's so many aspects to it, and it's such a subtle uh, and uh, multifaceted job, you know, because we have to know the technology, uh, we have to communicate well, we have to be able to listen really well, and we have to deal with the psychology uh, and the, of interaction and, and of art. So it's a really an endlessly fascinating and endlessly detailed job. Yeah. I'm interested in having you talk maybe just a little bit about your family. Mm -hmm. I know that your, your dad was a mathematician, your mom was a journalist. Tell me about them. Well, my father was an extreme, he, I think he was a true Renaissance man. He was a research mathematician, which is really one step removed from a poet, I would say. That, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it's, at that point you might think mathematics is more of a, of a you know, dry problem solving thing, but this is really leaps of, of creativity. Um, and uh, a true scientist, so it was really fascinating to be around uh, scientists, uh, many of whom were eccentric, if you can imagine that, uh, which is good, good uh, practice for being in the music business. Mm -hmm. And my mother was a, uh, a writer, uh, she wrote feature articles for the newspapers for the Champagne Courier and then later the News Gazette. And uh, she really was fascinated by people and interested in their stories. And, uh, it took me a long time to realize that if I put those things together, um, science and human interest, you get record making, right? We're taking sort of somewhat technical, but we're really taking portraits and sound of, of these different personalities that we're lucky enough to work well, with. Well, I was interested in, in one of the things that I read uh, uh, where you said you thought that there were some, you realized at some point that there were some real parallels between what your mom did as a writer, as a journalist, and what you were doing in the studio. Mm -hmm. it's, it's portraiture. And uh, we have to, we have so many uh, tools that we can use in making these portraits. We have to be very careful in how we portray someone and, and what they are thinking and, and uh, you know, it's really uh, their soul in, in many ways. Um, and we, so it's, we're in a position of, of great trust. Uh, and, but we also have to work with the artists and sometimes we maybe know what's best about them more than they do. And they're the things that they might want us to take out or fix, and, and especially these days where we have the technical tools to, to change and, and edit and fix so many things. Sometimes we have to be their, their conscience and their uh, an objective voice to help them uh, express the, the best parts of themselves. And I'm sure this is very difficult when you're dealing with people who maybe have a strong vision of what they want, maybe have strong egos. You're kind of a soft-spoken guy. Uh, how is it, if you have somebody who they say, look, this is what I want, just do it, and you're thinking, well, you know, we could do this a better way, how do you talk with them about what you think might be a better way? Well, again, it's a very subtle communication process, mm -hmm. um, and I will make suggestions, and, but I'll say these are only my suggestions. If, if I feel strongly about something, I might argue with them, but ultimately it is their record and uh, we are there to serve them and uh, also to serve the music. Uh, in some ways, I, I, I think of my clients as being sort of secondary to the music and so I, you have to treat them very well, but, it, but I think we're all kind of conduits for, uh, for the art and the music itself. But it is, it is very subtle and, and very complicated. Um, I think in some ways, if you, uh, you can provide alternatives and say, you know, what if we tried this or what do you think of that? I also think it's important in the process of record making to never say no. Mm -hmm. If they come in and they say, I, I have this idea 
and we might think that will never work. We could argue with them about it for half an hour, or we could try it for five minutes. And then if it doesn't work, they'll hopefully realize it. And uh, if it does work, then we'll be surprised. And uh, you know, there's no matter how long I've been making records, or any of us have been making records, uh, the artists know their art the best. So yeah. we're really there to serve their vision. So as, uh, as a musician now, you started playing when you were 12? Yes. Is that right? And did you start with the bass? I did, which is fairly unusual. Uh, many bass players are guitar players who switched. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was always fascinated by bass, uh, just the sound of it. I mean, I've always been fascinated by sound and music and just about everything else. Uh -huh. But, uh, I, you know, it, it's actually traceable to a number of specific events. One was I was going to a Marx Brothers Film Festival at the Thunderbird Theater in Urbana. There was a guitar store called Axe in Hand. And I was walking in, and I looked to my left, and there was this beautiful shining object in the window with, you know, as far in my, in my recollection, and again, a beam of light shining down, an angel singing around <laughs> it. And I was mesmerized, and I just walked in, and there was Skip, who influenced many people. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, 11 or 12, and I said, what is that? That young man is a Fender Precision bass. Wow, it's the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And a uh, beautiful object. So that was one. The other was uh, I went to the Howdy Hop at Uni High, which is the first dance of the semester. And uh, there was a band playing there called Headband. And I just remember the bass vibrating everything, my shoes and so forth. I thought that was really cool. And that's actually the band that later became the band that I've been in for the last 34 years, Captain, Captain Rat and Rat. Blind Rivets. The, the, the precision bass is, uh, I think, for a lot of bass players, people who play electric bass, is, that's the gold standard and has been for a long, long time. That's a big, heavy instrument. W when did you actually have your, get your first electric bass? And, and did, was it a precision bass? It, it wasn't. It took some time to find a, a, a good Fender. Uh, my first bass was a rented uh, Electra bass, and I had a Kalamazoo amplifier, which is the size of a cigar box or maybe mm -hmm. a little larger. Uh, I thought I was, you know, John Ed Whistle. Mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, started taking lessons right away. Um, but I don't know when I got my first Fender, probably 1975 or something like that. But it is an amazing instrument. It's, it's a kind of triumph of industrial design. It's really an unimprovable instrument, sort of like the violin. Uh, it fits well when you're sitting. It fits well when you're standing. It's balanced. It sounds great. So Leo Fender was uh, you know, part of that 50s era where people really uh, were making amazing products, amazing cars, and everything looked great and, and worked great. Yeah. Well, that's why I suppose, it, well, in, in guitar design, I suppose people have tried to do everything you possibly could do mm -hmm. with a lot of strange results. And, you know, maybe you know, the players are very idiosyncratic. Some one person likes one instrument and somebody likes another instrument. But it, it seems like that's that, that instrument, that particular bass, you know, and the other, and Stratocasters, Telecasters, and Les Pauls, people always want them, and they probably always will want them, and the, the old instruments are always going to be hugely in demand, and, and they're never going to lose their value. It's true. They sort of accidentally turned into good investments, but, mm -hmm. and also, you know, there's the aspect that we uh, all have our heroes, and, and so to be able to play something that they played makes us feel a little bit closer to that, although that's really just the tool. Yeah. Let's come back to, to the studio and to talk a little bit about how, how you get the, then from Faithful Studios to Pogo. Well, we had Faithful Sound for three years, and then I moved to a loft in downtown Champaign. Mm -hmm. Took a year off. This was at the time that my band was really playing. I think we played 250 shows that year. Just a lot. Okay, yeah. And, and a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so I was mainly playing, and so I took about a year off from recording, and then I got the urge to do it again. And we were living in this uh, building in downtown Champaign, and the uh, ground floor was available. So I decided to start converting that. And it took a, a long time. I was happy to have the time to envision it first, and really to spend a, be able to spend a lot of time thinking about what it would be like before we put it in. And then we did. And uh, by then, we had slowly built up the equipment. You know, we always uh, bought the equipment in cash, never took out any loans to do any of it. We just started with what Peter had and just when we'd have, you know, we would empty our pockets and go to Huey's and get whatever uh, we could, you know, duct tape and nails and things we needed. And we just really built it up from almost nothing uh, to what became a quite nice uh, middle-sized uh, professional recording studio. And a place that really had, a, I think, a good reputation, certainly was well known among local musicians. And you have had the chance to work with people who are indeed household 
names. And uh, I think that I also read somewhere that you said that you actually never advertised and you never had to because the reputation of the place seemed to spread and people knew about it. They knew where it was even though there wasn't a big sign that said, here it is. Yeah. Well, uh, that's really the only way that a service like that will succeed is by word of mouth. Um, I mean, the, the advertising that we did, which was basically a Yellow Pages ad, brought in a lot of interesting people with reel-to-reel -reel tapes of Christmas 1964 and, you know, uh, asked tape recordings of GIs and so forth, but not really that many clients. The, the clients listen to other people's records and they go on the basis of, of what they've heard and, and their experience. And the other thing is, uh, having been in business for as long as I have, you know, you work with a band and if they have a good experience, uh, pretty certainly within a couple of years that will split into four bands and then you have more clients so yeah. it's it's uh, I've been very lucky to get to do something that is just endlessly fascinating and uh, where I've never felt like I'm working yeah I've uh, I don't know that I've been in that many studios I a couple I guess and I've seen pictures of, of various studios and and they're all very different places uh, and it all depending on you know the the aesthetic sense or design sense of whoever it is that that said, well, in addition to the acoustics, there are certain things you have to have. Mm -hmm. You want to have a kind of a feel to it. And some, actually, that I've seen pictures of are remarkably sterile-looking places that can produce very evocative music. So you sort of wonder, well, how exactly does that happen? What, what about the place and contributes to that? Or, or maybe another way of saying is, well, what, what, how do you make a place that's that's warm and inviting, where people are going to feel comfortable, where they will do the, their best work. Yeah, uh, it's essentially important. Just the, the feel of it, the vibe of it is, is really critical. And it's one of the things that fascinates me about the studio world. Uh, I get to take my students to all sorts of different studios, and each of them is an expression of the personality of the person who has it. And I'm just fascinated by the, the use of space and the lighting and the color. Uh, you know, paint colors and so forth. So it's a little bit of everything and everyone has their own vision of the ultimate environment to make music in. So um, I, I really love that about the mm -hmm. process. Well, when you, were, when you were designing your own place, how did you approach that? Well, I, I, I was, as I said, I was lucky enough to be able to really think about it for a long time beforehand. Um, and some of it happened by, uh, through a process of evolution and just moving things around. And, and uh, I'm also a great accumulator uh, and uh, accumulator of instruments and uh, equipment that all have their own story. So it's, it's partly a matter of thought and partly a matter of a kind of evolution, mm -hmm. which I'm getting to do again now that we're putting the studio in in Nashville. That's uh, one thing I, I want to make sure that we at least mention for, you know, for people who are mourning uh, Poco. Uh, it is a loss for Champaign-Urbana, for downtown Champaign, but you have now settled in Nashville and you are setting up there and you will again be doing recording work when you have the opportunity there. And we were talking about it before we, we started. I think you decided that it couldn't be called anything other than Pogo. That's correct. Yeah, I've been thinking of calling it you know, Pogo of the South or Pogo del Sud or something like that. But uh, we bought Steve Earle's old place and it has a, a house and a fairly large area and then a, a full-size professional studio that was built from the ground up. And uh, so last Tuesday we put the pogo equipment in there and uh, now I'm starting to en envision again and see how it's going to be. But it's a little bit larger than the Champagne place. It has more isolation rooms, which is something that, I've, that I wanted to have here. Mm. And something else that makes me extremely happy is that the people who bought the pogo building in downtown Champagne are putting a recording studio in there. So it will continue as a studio and that really makes me glad. I would hate to see it turn into another bar or a, you know, another clothing store or something like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but uh, it's, it's really wonderful when I think of all the music that's gone in there and uh, all the uh, experiences that we had in there. It's nice to see that continue yeah. with young people. I want to ha give you a chance to talk a little bit about the, the, the mechanism of recording, something about what happens and, and the various pieces here. But one thing, I, again, I think if people have seen pictures of studios, of the control room side, they know that in studios they all have enormous control boards that have a million knobs on them. I mean, I have any idea what those things do, but you know, you say, oh, recording studio, yes, I know what that looks like. 
And for people who work in studios, there's a lot of mystery atta that attaches and special mojo <laughs> that mm -hmm. attaches to the boards. Tell me about the one that you've got. It's a fantastic thing. It's uh, an API console. API is one of the uh, earlier manufacturers of recording consoles. And, uh, they made them since 1967. Uh, but this one was custom built by a guy named Frank Demidio. And there's very little information. I, I can't even figure out how many of these were made, uh, maybe 20 or 30 of these consoles ever. Uh, Demidio was the chief engineer for Radio Havana, as far as I can tell, before Castro. And he mm -hmm. came to San Francisco where he started custom building mixing consoles for studios. So he built studios for a guy, uh, consoles for a guy named Wally Hyder, who recorded a lot of the San Francisco scene music. And my console was custom built for Fantasy Studios in Berkeley. Uh, it was in their Studio C, so it was mainly used, uh, as far as I could tell, for Credence Records. Credence Clearwater, Credence Clearwater Revival. Revival. Their music ran, was recorded, ran through that board. Through that board. And uh, then when they left Fantasy, they had Domitio build them an exact replica. So there's another one that's identical, which is interesting because uh, they're, they're custom built. And in 1970, when a house cost maybe $30,000, this thing was $105,000. And uh, it really, there is nothing better sounding on the planet. There are some equally good sounding boards, but it's just a, the sound of it is fantastic, mainly because it's simple. It makes it operationally difficult because it doesn't have all the features of a modern console, but uh, you don't need as many features if it sounds great to begin with. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I really like about it is that it is, uh, it's, it's light gray. It's a kind of a battleship gray. So much of that stuff is black, which makes the knobs hard to read. And it's part of what I call the Darth Vader school of industrial design. Uh, and I, I like something that's uh, a little bit lighter and, and uh, feels more creative in that yeah. way. Well, one, uh, another thing I, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned, because we did talk about, you did talk about the fact that you are reconstituting Pogo there at your house in Nashville. So Pogo lives, long live Pogo. Yes. Uh, something else, though, that I think that it is pretty cool is that the the Sousa Archives mm -hmm. and Center for American Music, which is part of the U of I Library, has acquired two collections of material that document the history of Pogo. Uh, and uh, so they are going to hold on to all of this stuff that you recorded there. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's a, it's a lot of stuff, and so it's uh, nice of them to keep it in catalog and keep it in good shape. But it is a documentary. You know, this. Uh, I hope that people in Champion Havana realize what a magnificent community this is. And uh, the fact that the music scene here is more than a scene, it's a community. And there are a lot of places that have music scenes, mm -hmm. but this r truly is a community where if you go to a show, much of the audience is comprised of other musicians who support uh, whoever's playing. Everybody uh, plays with each other and works together. Um, it's just the, the level of talent that's here and the level of communication and so forth it is phenomenal. We just have, it's just the right size place and we have all the ingredients that we need to make a, a viable and fantastic place. So I'm glad to have been able to play a part in, in it and to have some uh, documents to uh, leave. Yeah. Well, as, as great an opportunity being able to go to Blackbird is for you, it, it must have also been bittersweet for, for sure to be leaving this place where you had pretty much lived all your life and had, uh, had built this studio and had this long association with the band that you're in. That must have been hard. It is in a way, and, uh, but I'm still back. My sister and nieces are here and my band is still here. And I, although I quit my university job and closed down my studio and sold the building that we owned and so forth, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I consider this to be my hometown. And, um, it, so it, it was bittersweet, but I'm so excited about getting to be there. Uh, and it's, I'm happy to embark on an adventure at this advanced age and uh, to be able to, to uh, explore a new place and get to make new friends and yeah. plan to we, keep all the others. We're almost at the, the point where we have to finish. Maybe just, just one other thing that I, I guess really struck me in, uh, that you said in an interview, and again, it goes back to this idea of, you know, who are you and how is this, this place that you make an extension of you, you said, ideally a business should be an extension of the person driving it. And I suppose that could be for good or for ill. 
But if, if you think, say you think about this, the studio that you built and now that you're rebuilding, how would you say that Pogo is an extension of you? <laughs> well, for, for better or worse, uh, it's uh, this compendium of just all the things that I'm interested in, which turn out to be an awful lot of things. So um, I, I'm, I'm really interested in everything and always have been. Um, and so there's a little bit of that, and hopefully it creates an environment that is um, conducive to people's creativity and exploration. Uh, but it's, uh, on, uh, on the other side, it's also maybe a, too much of an expression of my cluttered brain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, all the things I'm interested in, I'm, and I, I find that I'm really, uh, you know, I studied literature, and I'm really interested in, in, in people and their uniqueness and their qualities and their character. And um, I think it's useful to be in a place that has all of those qualities, and, I, and hopefully that brings out those aspects of the people that I get to work with. Well, that's a good place for us to stop. Thank you so and much. We must. Thank you very much for it's talking with pleasure. us. It's a great We appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Thanks. I also want to say, too, to you folks who are watching, thanks very much for being with us. And uh, next time, join us for another edition of Illinois.